How many know he's with us this morning? He's with us this morning, and I'm grateful today that the Lord is with us. And this message is very special to me. I was asking, Lord, how do you want me to give this message to your people and those who may be streaming this message and those who are on my org on this great day, on this pastor's appreciation. Normally there is a pastor who's preaching, but for the situation, there's me, and I'm grateful that I could give you this this morning. It, it was, it's an honor and a pleasure, pleasure to give a message and preach to you what thus says the Lord for me, and I'm grateful today that the Lord has given me this. I want to give you this message today called The Great and Sovereign Plans of Salvation. One of the things that I preach is salvation. And this message is very special to me because it is a depiction of me and two people. Two people and what I believe in the Lord's mission also. And I said, Lord, you help me put this in a way you want it and give me the right scriptures. And he did. He gave this to me about three weeks ago. But it's a depiction of two people. But it describes myself. And on this great day, I want you to receive this for your own and be encouraged to. The great and sovereign plans of salvation. We're going to be in. First, I mean, Second Timothy 1, verse 1, 6 through 14. Verse 1 says, <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. Paul, hallelujah, Paul, an apostle, of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promises of life, which is in Christ Jesus. We're going to start at the sixth verse. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoners, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to the, the light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher for the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that, this, that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast a pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, that good things which are committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this time and thank you for this wonderful great day that you've blessed us with. Lord, I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours. And I honor you, Lord Jesus, because of this wonderful day that you have made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. I thank you, Father, for how good you are to us. And Lord, bless these lips of clay as I preach to your people a special message that you've given me to give to them. And I honor you, Lord, because of how wonderful you are. I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in your strength, your Holy Spirit. 
And I thank you, Lord, in your precious name. Everyone say amen. amen. Lord, bless the reading and the hearing of his word. As a pastor and a preacher of the great gospel of the Lord, the Lord already knew before birth the plans he would have for me. He knew the plans that he had for you. And he knew that each person that he created had the ultimate plan of salvation if they would accept it. The plan of salvation is the greatest laid out plans ever made or set forth for execution. I'm talking about the great and sovereign plans of salvation. In 2 Timothy, the old preacher who was Paul is still teaching and advising the young preacher, Timothy. I find myself in both of them. And in some aspects, Paul is passing the torch to Timothy, and in some aspects, as you read both First and Second Timothy, he is saying that I'm about to finish out the plans of salvation that the Lord has for me. So, so at first glance, shy Timothy hardly seemed to be a satisfactory and suitable replacement, but Paul had few options. He says in 1 Timothy 1 to 15, everyone in province of Asia has deserted me. So this letter in 2 Timothy reveals his deep reliance on Timothy's loyal friendship. Life was closing in on the apostle and he felt a somber sense of abandonment. You know, at times in this letter, Paul, he lectures Timothy like a, like a master sergeant. He's calling on him to stand firm in his salvation, to overcome shame and hold to the faith and to let and to let, let no one question his ministry. Elsewhere, his tone softens to a fond affirmation of a grateful father. And throughout the bonds of the deep friendship are evident in three scriptures, from Paul recalling Timothy's family heritage. He, he, he's urging Timothy to bring him a heavy coat before him in winter. So it's like a father. And with Paul, this was an emotional moment in writing this letter. Paul, Paul's mood alternate between sadness and confidence, homesickness and critical concern. That song we saw, heard, saw this morning that Brenda presented talked about confidence. And as he wrote this letter, he contemplated the disturbing and unsettling months ahead and the prospect of the young divided churches left without his guidance. And in these last known written words, and these are the last known written words of Paul, he sought to prepare Timothy for the foreseeable day when the message of God would depend on him and other reliable workers. And despite the circumstances, Paul's farewell message from behind bars is gracious, is even victorious. See, the spreading of the gospel is far too a big of a task to be limited to any one man. Paul says in chapter 2 and 9, he says, For which I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even to the point of chains. And then Paul declares this. He says, but the word of God is not chained. Mm -hmm. right. See, I feel like Paul and Timothy wrapped up in one body because I'm so, persuade, so persuaded and passionate about the gospel of the Lord and his pro proclamation to the world and being, and being the 12-year-old the preacher being called to ministry and being advised and being taught over the years by, 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 by the great heroes of faith that have come and gone in my life. They all proclaimed the salvation message and handed it down to me, and, and I proclaim it today as I preach the great and sovereign plans of salvation. 
Salvation involves a sovereign plan. Notice that if you read about Paul, he, he says that his conversion was a result of belief. Salvation cannot be worked up or prayed down. It can only be accompanied or accomplished through simple faith. Notice what the Bible says about the means of matter of salvation. Of course, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 10 and 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved and so on and so forth. Salvation can only be yours through faith in Jesus Christ. So what is faith? As a young child growing up and, 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 and didn't realize as a, young, as a three-year-old when I got saved, I didn't realize what the Lord was going to bring me to today, how he's going to make me a preacher in this great church today. But as a child, as I was going, growing up, I was always taught that the word faith is defined as complete confidence, trust, or reliance. Faith in regard to God means that having total trust in Jesus Christ for the salvation of one's soul. It means trust in Jesus and him alone and him completely for salvation. Faith is absolutely essential for, for, for salvation. Faith also implies letting go of one's self-effort. Being saved means that we are to trust Jesus and him alone for the salvation of our souls. It is also based on absolute belief. And I'm thankful that since the age of three, I have kept that absolute faith in Jesus Christ. And that, and, for, and, and that is the reason that I am a preacher today. And this comes from the great and sovereign plans of salvation that he has for me. The Lord's plans flow through Christ Jesus, saints. So, so here we go. Paul says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. When we were united with Christ, life takes on both immediate and eternal dimensions. Paul uses the phrase, the promise of life is in Christ Jesus. That can apply to the life that Jesus gives immediately to those who trust him, as well as to the life fully realized in eternity. See, on one hand, Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. So life begins at conversion. Yet on the other hand, in Romans 8, 23, it says, not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The present experience we enjoy provides a foretaste of our complete redemption in Christ's return. When we struggle with difficulties in our life, remember that the best is yet to come. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The best is yet to come. And I want, you, I want to say this. As a young preacher, I kept that in mind in my soul. My mentors and, and, and my forefathers and my heroes who've passed on always told me that the best is yet to come. And here's one I knew. The part of my best to come was when I met and married my Carolyn, the beautiful and gifted love of my life who covers me in prayer each day. That was part of my best to come. The Lord's sovereign plans flow through gifts also. In 2 Timothy 1 and 6 it says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
You know, at the time of, of his ordination, young Timothy had received special gifts of the Spirit to enable him to serve the church. 1 Timothy 4 and 14 says, Do not neglect the gifts that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. See, in telling Timothy to stir up those gifts, Paul was encouraging him to persevere. Why? Because there was a sovereign plan for him. Timothy did not need new re revelations or new gifts. He needed the courage and the self-discipline to hang on to the truth and to use the gifts he had already received. Timothy, what he would do, he would step out boldly in faith and proclaim the gospel once again. The Holy Spirit will go with him and give him the power. He would do that for each of us too. And I thank God that all these years of preaching. That the Lord has endowed me with this Holy Spirit. To preach the gospel with holy boldness and without fear. When you use the gift of God has given you. You will find that God will give you the power you need to accomplish whatever the task he gives you. And, and we see clearly that Timothy's spiritual gifts had given him, when, that was given to him when, when Paul and the elders had laid their hands on him and set him apart for ministry. And you know what, I, I, I remember when I was a youngster and when I was maturing as a young preacher in my teens and, and in 20s and so forth, that, that there were elders from time to time who laid their hands on me and anointed me with oil that the Spirit of the Lord would protect the gifts and the calling that I had. And when I was ordained almost 15 years ago at the District Council in Branson, Missouri, Pastor George Westlake, one of my mentors and his son and now a pastor of Sheffield and other pastors and Carolyn, laid their hands on me that the Lord will bless me and our future. God gives all Christian gifts to use to build up the body of Christ. And he gives special gifts to, to, to some through church leaders who serve as God's instruments also. And what else he does? His sovereign plans flow through the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 1, 6-7 says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gifts of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy, here, here, here young Timothy was experiencing great opposition to the message and himself as a leader. His youth, his, 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 his association with Paul. And his leadership had come under fire from believers and non-believers alike. Yeah. Paul urged him to be bold. When we allow the people to intimidate us, we neutralize our effectiveness for God. See, the power of the Holy Spirit can help us overcome our fear of what some might say or do to us so that we can continue to do the Lord's work. Folks, I can preach to you without the Holy Spirit on my side. I'm not, and I will not try to. I cannot preach without the Holy Spirit on my side, and if you say that you can, you're in for a fight with me. See, in verse 7, Paul mentions three characteristics of the effective Christian leader. Power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. That sound mind which is wisdom. See these are available to us because the Holy Spirit lives in us. See follow his leading each day so that your life will more fully exhibit these characteristics. But all of us need to follow these fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5 22 to 23 says this. This is for all of us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. 
And also, his sovereign plans flow through suffering. 2 Timothy 1 and 8 says this. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So in this time of mounting persecution, young Timothy may have been afraid to continue preaching the gospel. His fears were based on the fact because because believers were being arrested and executed. Paul told Timothy this. He says to expect suffering. Yeah. He says to expect suffering. Timothy, like Paul, would be jailed for preaching the gospel. But Paul promised Timothy that God would give him strength and that he would be ready when it was his turn to suffer. Yeah. And even when there is no persecution, sharing our faith in Christ can be difficult. Fortunately, we like Paul and Timothy, which I'm both today, can rely, rely, rely on the Holy Spirit to give us courage. I rely on the Holy Spirit to guide and protect my heart and my mouth when the gospel ministry that the Lord gave me I rely on the Holy Spirit to guide and protect my heart and my mouth when the gospel ministry that the Lord gave me is in question. Because the enemy is always on the job of discouraging. But there is no weapon formed against me that will prosper because I plead the blood of Jesus against it. And I don't, and don't be ashamed to testify of your personal faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 1 and 16 says, for I am not ashamed. Let me say it again. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God of salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And also can say this, greater is he who is in me than he who was in the world. And then in 2 Timothy 1, 9 through 11, it says, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not unto our works, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. See, in these verses, Paul gives a brief summary of the gospel, gospel that I preach. God loves us. He chose us. And he sent Christ to die for us. We can have eternal life through faith in him because he broke the power of death with his resurrection. We do not deserve to be saved, but God offers us salvation anyway. What we must do is believe in him and accept this offer of salvation. And if you're listening today under the sound of my voice, don't refuse the Lord's invitation for salvation. And then his sovereign plans flow through his protection. You know, I thank God for the protection he has given me in this gospel ministry. 2 Timothy 1 and 12 says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Yes, yes, Lord. See, in spite of the suffering, 
that might have caused Peter to despair, he affirmed his confidence in God's protection. See, this was not a claim to strong faith, but rather it was trust in one so powerful, so omnipotent that even a weak faith was sufficient. Paul, what he did, he based his confidence in Christ on his close and intimate relationship with him. Paul knew the one in whom he trusted with personal knowledge. He knew Christ so well that no earthly experience could break the bond of love by which Christ held him. And I know personally, personally for me, on this day, personally for me on this day, I know whom I've served. And I know that he is looking out for me and Carolyn. And at this time of our lives, even through this pandemic, he is looking out for all of us. Listen, if your, your situation looks dreary and depressing, give your concerns to Christ Jesus because you know him. Realize that he will guard you. He will guard all you have entrusted in him. Your physical life, your spiritual life, and your blessed salvation. He will guard them until the day his mighty, of his mighty return. We have security in Jesus Christ. And also I believe that the phrase, keep what I have committed to him, it meant that Paul was confident that though he was in prison and facing death, God would carry out the gospel ministry through others such as Timothy. I'm thankful. I'm thankful today that my mentors, my forefathers of the gospel had confidence in me to keep the gospel moving forward. See, Paul may have expressed his confidence to encourage Timothy, who was undoubtedly discouraged by the problems in Ephesus and fearful of persecution. But even in prison, Paul knew that God was still in control. Folks, I know personally that the Lord is still in control. No matter what setbacks or problems we face, we can trust fully in our sovereign and awesome Lord. Here's what Smith Wigglesworth said, and I was reading him. I read him every day. He says, let's leave Dowding Street and live on Faith Victory Street. I live on that street today. And as I end... With 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 14, which says this. It says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Amen. Timothy was in a time of transition. He had been Paul's bright young helper, and, and soon he would be on his own as a leader of a church in a difficult environment. And although his responsibilities were changing, Timothy was not without help. He had everything he needed to face the future if he would hold on tightly to the Lord's hands and his resources. And that's what I'm doing today. I'm holding on tightly. I told you that I keep my hands. Sometimes I keep it bald. I'm not just doing it. I'm holding on to God's hand tightly. Tightly. Someone say tightly. I'm holding the Lord's hands tightly at his resources. And when we're facing difficult transitions, we need to follow Paul's advice to Timothy and look back at your experience. Let me ask you if you understand my voice today. Who is your foundation of faith? 
How can you build on that foundation? What gifts has the Holy Spirit given you? Use the gifts he been use the gifts you've been given. Remember, you have the gift of salvation on your side and the Holy Spirit <laughs> to guide you. I'm thankful that he's guiding me today in my words. See, the agenda of ministry of the gospel is not just a direct ministry or to a focus set. But I've always been advised and directed by great men of the Lord in my life that the gospel message of salvation and Jesus crucified should reach the world and be proclaimed to every person. You know what? I'm glad that I have that confidence that Paul has this morning. My salvation does not, nor has it ever depended on me or what I can do. My salvation depends totally upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's able to do through his limitless power. You know what, if you're listening today, I want every one of you to know that there is a great big God in heaven who keeps every saint he saves. He's able and he will get us home in one piece. Thank you. Don't you know that today? Thank you. He's able and he was going to get us home in one piece. Amen. And as we close today, let me remind you that what he has started, he will finish. As I close now this morning, I want you to ask, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. You understand my voice, have you been saved today? If your answer is no, then I want to remind you that God loves you and has made a way for you to be saved. He saved me at three years old. And I've been living for Jesus ever since, living for Christ ever since. Never turned my back on him. None of us has ever been perfect in our lives, but Lord has always kept me focused on him. Have you ever been saved this morning? If your answer is no, then I want to remind you of something. Remind you that God loves you and has made a way for you to be saved. If you'd like to get the matter of your salvation squared away this morning, then I want you to make a decision for Jesus today. Who knows in his house that he can make a difference? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he can, he can make a difference. I see lives in his church who, who he's made a difference. And they're living for God today. He can make you into a new creation. He can make you into a new person. He can give you a purpose in your life. He's a God of change. He can change your heart, mind, and soul. If he can if he can change a life, and I was just reading this, reading about this, if he can change the life of a master of a Ku Klux Klan and turn him around, guess what he can do for you? If he can heal and set free someone who has been in drugs and meth and alcohol and all kinds of stuff and turn them into preachers. Guess what he can do for you? If he can turn a prostitute from a street corner and make her into an evangelist, guess what he can do for you? We have a God that can do all that and even more. So nothing that you've done in the past is, 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 is inexcusable that you cannot come to God. 
somebody says, well, what I've done, he won't excuse me. Just think of what others have done. And he can save you. He can make the difference. That's why as I always say in my messages, why don't you meet him now? Because you don't want to meet him later. Just bow your heads with me, folks. Bow your heads with me. And if you're listening today and you was encouraged by this messenger and you want to make a change and give God your life this morning, he's ready to do it. And he's beckoning now, not, not tomorrow, but today. Do it, do it today. Do it today. Because tomorrow's not promised to you. And he wants your life this morning. Give him your life today. And as we bow our heads in this church, we agree with you that the Lord will save you. And we're going to pray for our families too. And as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, if you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior in this house, raise your hand today. Hallelujah. We want Jesus to come into your life this morning. So if you're looking, if you're watching this, bow your heads with us. Repeat after me in this repentance prayer. Say this with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you for this moment in time that you've blessed me to, in, that you blessed me to view. Father, I know that you're with me. You're in my decision to give my life over to you. I thank you, Father, for this time. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins and my shame. Give me a new walk. Give me a new talk. Give me a new way of living my life. Because Lord, I want to live my life for you. And I thank you, Father, for blessing me to pray this prayer. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And if I was the only one on earth, you would have died for me. And I thank you, Father, for dying on the cross for me. Now, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me of my sins. And now, Lord, I believe. I have faith. I have trust and confidence in you that I'm saved. And I thank you for saving me. Thank you, Lord. I will live for you for the rest of my life because I want eternal life in your name. Amen. Give God a hand of praise today. Hallelujah. Thank you.